Hello, and uh, welcome to our Impact Seminar. Today, our focus is on understanding and enhancing the connections between researchers and policymakers. This subject holds increasing significance as governments and research funding agencies seek evidence regarding the tangible impact of their sponsored research on public policy decisions and ultimately on the lives of people. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our esteemed speaker, Professor Matthew Flinders. Uh, Matt holds the position of Professor of Politics at the University of Sheffield and has served as chair of the university's policy engagement network from 2019 to 2022. He also contributed as a member of the Economic and Social Research Council Board in the UK from 2016 to 2019. And here he significantly influenced the design and implementation of several significant cross-disciplinary initiatives. Additionally, he led two national assessments for UKRI on research leadership and collaborated with numerous evidence and policy networks globally. He is the author of 14 books and over 200 peer-reviewed research articles and book chapters. His contributions extend beyond academia, having scripted and presented multiple documentaries for BBC Radio 4 and frequently contributing to the Times Higher. Coming back to our session today then, navigating the intersection of research and policy poses significant challenges and a range of obstacles. In this seminar, Professor Flinders will explore the concept of strategic scaffolding, emphasizing its significance in overcoming these obstacles. There will be some time at the end of the seminar for questions. So please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and ask your questions as we go along. So I'll now hand over to Professor Flinders uh, to begin the seminar. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. And I hope everybody can see my first opening slide there. Um, okay, this afternoon, I want to talk about strategic scaffolding. And um, I want to talk about the ways in which academics and research support staff can be both supported, trained and incentivized to do more policy engagement, but also to be aware of both the challenges and the uh, opportunities that come with this being an increased focus of uh, academic life. So why am I talking about this today? Well, obviously, Ireland has Impact 2030, which is uh, your research and innovation strategy. Uh, a key part of that strategy is towards a stronger emphasis on policy engagement within higher education. And what's really important when I was you know, having a kind of a, a look through all these documents is just how many of the uh, ambitions, aims and objectives are very similar, not just to those that have been promoted in the UK for quite some time, but are actually now really big global images and issues all around the world. Um, and I'll come to the creation of policy evidence-based networks more globally towards the end of my talk. But what's really interesting, if you look at the um, strategy in Ireland, is that what it's really focused on is maximizing the value of publicly funded research for both social and economic gain. And what this is creating is a focus on, amongst other things, knowledge creation, but more importantly, knowledge mobilization, a focus on boundary spanning, and therefore on docking points. I mean, one of the interesting things that I hope we'll be able to talk about today is that what, what I'm fascinated by is that there is a whole new scientific language evolving around understanding, facilitating, navigating the research policy nexus. So 
part of that language is an emphasis on facilitating mobility, the mobility of people, knowledge and talent across traditional disciplinary, organisational and professional boundaries. And this in itself focuses and creates an emphasis on thinking about research leadership and what does research leadership mean within universities? What would a future focused Irish university be doing in terms of supporting its researchers, not just early career researchers, but mid-career researchers, established senior researchers? What are the new forms of support for professional development and how do we make sure that these are in place? So the way I'm going to kind of cut into all of this is by looking at and trying to trace back developments in the UK in recent years. Why? Because um, I've been quite involved in trying to um, design and deliver many of these developments in terms, of, in terms of research infrastructure, but also an understanding of the changing research culture and research incentives. Um, but also, I think actually the UK has been incredibly active, if not hyperactive in this space. And the space is how do you get more researchers engaging with policy makers to maximise the value of publicly funded research? Is that I think although the UK has made great strides and developed very quickly, I think there are also lessons to be learned here about, dare I say, what works and what hasn't worked. And I think the UK is at a particular moment in this debate where all Irish universities, Irish funders, Irish policymakers, in terms of thinking about Ireland 2030, could, could identify some use, useful insights. So my main argument today is that the UK does provide lots of valuable lessons. One thing that's clear is that there's been a lot of institutional innovation in this space, in the space between research, our education and policy. But basically what's lacking and why I've given it the title for today, what's lacking is any strategic scaffolding, which joins together all the investments and changes and innovations that have happened. The paradox is that many of those innovations have happened in order to try and join up across the, we don't talk about the system anymore. We did talk about the landscape. Now the, the language that we use is the research development and innovation ecosystem. What's happened is so many different developments have been rolled out so quickly. We've almost created greater complexity rather than creating greater coordination. And I want to explain this through three steps, steps that might help people in Ireland uh, think about uh, what's happened and what you need to try to nurture greater relationships between higher education and policy. So first step one is money. This greater emphasis of taking research into policy knowledge creation to knowledge mobilization brings with it costs. And these costs have been delivered in the UK, both directly and indirectly in a number of ways. It will be very hard, I think, for any institution, either working alone or within a broader context, to really develop policy engagement capacity without some targeted additional financial resource. So, What's happened in the UK? Well, since 2014, the Research Excellence Framework, or REF, has included impact case studies. This means that all departments in every university, in every discipline, has to be constantly minded about delivering auditable impact case studies that show how their research has affected policy or the public sphere more broadly. Those impact case studies are a, a, a large component of your overall REF score. And REF scores are important because not only does your REF score af affect how much money you get through what's called QR money, but also increasingly for overseas students, 
they use your um, ref performance in order to choose where to go and study. So actually, ref has significant non-direct financial implications for universities because foreign students often use ref scores as a proxy for where to go to study. More specifically, what we've had in the last few years is the introduction of IAAs, Impact Acceleration Accounts. These are uh, core budgets delivered by the research councils to around 30 universities, which is basically a sole budget that universities can play, can invest in whichever research projects they have that they think can deliver real public social value. So impact acceleration accounts are not to fund research, but are there to fund that research into action practice. One of the interesting things there is that not all universities have impact acceleration accounts. So only probably 20% of UK universities have them. And what we have in the UK is a very uneven, uneven field in terms of capacity to be very active in policy engagement because UK government research funding only goes into a fairly small number of those universities, Russell Group, that are identified as the research active universities. Maybe we'll talk about that later. Uh, we also have uh, Research England has a policy support fund that puts around a million pounds a year. Again, this is Research England only. But in those top 18 English universities, they get an additional million pounds a year to invest solely in policy focused research. And then most of the big research funding projects that are coming out of UKRI are themselves increasingly hypothecated around specific research and public problems. So. The space for just putting in a research grant on any topic you want is narrowing, whereas most of the time there is a research program launched around a particular global challenge or issue, and researchers have to mould what they want to do around a politically identified public problem. And in doing so, they're expected to work closely through co-production and co-design with potential research users which explains why we talk about the ecosystem now. Um, just an aside, it's worth just noting that the next REF, we are having another REF, REF 2028. And um, amazingly, lots of universities are now already doing lots of work around preparing for REF 2028. And it's interesting that this is explicitly going to adopt a much broader definition of research excellence and a much broader definition of research impact to move it away from just thinking about policy engagement to a much broader approach to public engagement. That's something we might talk about, but something that's been broadly welcomed in a UK context. So step one, if you want to get more activity and to incentivize and facilitate activity at the research policy interface, you need to invest resources, financial in resources to allow that to happen. The second step is around structures. One of the most important things about the creation of UKRI in 2015 was that it was all about increasing connectivity and facilitating greater collaboration, not just at an interdisciplinary level, so all the former research councils have formally now been um, amalgamated into UKRI, although they still exist as subcommittees within it. But UKRI, what's really interesting now looking back is it was first of all created on a rationale of facilitating greater interdisciplinarity. Actually, what's happened since it was established is that yes, there's been a much bigger emphasis on interdisciplinarity. This last two days, I've been chairing a new commissioning panel for large interdisciplinary projects. But I think what's as or more interesting is UKRI has led to a much bigger em emphasis on connecting beyond academia into research. So it's almost a matrix of horizontal greater capacity across the scientific spectrum but also at the same time, greater connectivity out and beyond academe to bring potential research users 
into the research process. So what's really interesting is that in recent years, there's been a much sharper divide between research, doing research, and funding research infrastructure. There's been a lot more emphasis on the latter. Research infrastructure, and what structures do we need to put in place to deliver, nurture, and underpin the sort of research that will allow maximum value for publicly funded research? A few elements and examples of this. We have the um, ARIs. I don't know if, if you have ARIs in Ireland, areas of research interest. What this basically means is that all government departments, lots of government public bodies, arms length bodies, some charities, and even some parliamentary committees now produce every year a statement of areas of research interest where they would welcome university-based researchers working with them to co-create knowledge, research, evidence around those particular topics. Let me just show you this. So what we have now in the UK is a new ARI database where any academic can go onto this database they can type in some keywords around the research that they do or what they're interested in, and it will automatically plug you into those government departments or organisations that have said they need and would like to work with researchers on that specific topic. So the ARIs have evolved to become a very interesting docking point between researchers and policymakers. Um, absolutely crucial and of increasing uh, significance. Another important part of this ecosystem and changing to the research infrastructure is that we now have this very developed system of what works centers. Now, what works centers, um, and again, I apologize, I don't know, you might have these or have something close to them in Ireland and have had them for some time, but what works centers um, are there to be boundary spanning bodies. They are funded by public money. They're funded to support research, but they're not, they're not funded to do more research. They're funded to facilitate the connection of existing research into policy. And that's why you have this range of different what work centers in different policy areas. And, and they all vary a little bit in terms of exactly who funds them and how they work. But essentially, again, they are established to act as a boundary spanning body to help take research into policy. And there are discussions now about the creation of new what work centers. And this is where we start getting into a little bit of the, dare I say, hyperactivity, is that where we've got to now in the UK is that on top of the what work centers, we have an, an increasing array of observatories or policy and evidence centers. Now, these again are created not as mainstream traditional research centers or institutes. We still have competitions to create those quite separately. The observatories and the policy and evidence session centers are established to be once again boundary spanning bodies that are charged with developing expertise and facilitating connectivity between researchers and policymakers. Since the observatories, I'm involved in several of these on the net. Is the is and a what work center or the difference between an observatory and a policy and evidence center that are all broadly hybrid structures that are there to put into policy. And again, I just put this in so you know, uh, this is the latest exactly where we're at. And I think it could be very interesting, um, given the Island 2030 ambitions, that what we have just established in the UK, literally, I was on the commissioning panel just a couple of weeks ago, are LPIPs, Local Policy and Innovation Partnerships. 
Uh, I've put a link to all the information on the slides. The slides will be sent round afterwards. What's really interesting about LPIPs is once again, these are boundary spanning organizations funded by the research councils, not to do loads of new research, but to exist at the intersection of potential research users and university-based researchers. The interesting thing about the LPIPs is that they're place-based. So these are based usually within a city region. So there's a Yorkshire and Humberside LPIP. Um, there's a, um, a, an Edinburgh-based LPIP. And these are all, again, about building new forms of research infrastructure that are explicitly about pulling together researchers with potential research users and opening up those conversations that facilitate an understanding of where the value might lie between existing research, but also what research might be usefully commissioned to be of most public value. But this place-based initiative is as far as things have got in the UK at the moment, the what work centres are all more nationally based. Now I said, suggested at least it would get complicated. So step three is what we also have in the UK are a number of boundary spanning networks that are not about particular policy sectors nor are they about particular place-based initiatives like the LPIPs, but they are structures that try to, once again, connect in researchers into policymakers. And I think what's also interesting about these, things like the University UPenn, Universities Policy Engagement Network, POST, Parliamentary Office for Science and Technology, is that these boundary spanners are attempting to connect researchers in all institutions across the UK. So what why I think these are particularly important is because if you are in um, a Russell Group University and you've got an AII account and you're getting Research England policy focused money, you've actually got quite a lot of resource that you can use to invest in research into policy activities and employ professional knowledge broker staff to help academics do that work. Whereas if you're in one of the other 100 universities in the UK that doesn't have access to those specific resource streams, then you're at a disadvantage. What these institutions here do is try to provide a leveling up of the whole higher education ecosystem so that different universities can learn from each other and share best, best practice they can share training. And this is a real way that nationally and in Scotland and in Wales at a more devolved level, universities have tried to work together and particularly those that aren't in the research intensive group. Now, I said that there were there were three steps. It was about money. It was uh, about infrastructure. Um, but actually, there's been something else happened, which is very, very interesting. And this relates back to mobility, that there's it's not just about creating structures and money, but there is also a need to facilitate the mobility of people to move across. One of the big emphasis in the UK at the moment is about how do we get more university based researchers to be able to spend time and experience working in non-academic but research related environments so there's been a lot of changes happening recently which are trying to focus not so much on new structures but on facilitating mobility which is really really important and i think what's interesting about the mobility angle is that often university um promotions and reward systems are still quite narrow and they don't possibly reward mobility and the gaining of experience, skills and understanding in a broader range of areas that actually relate directly to policy engagement activities. So 
recently what's happened, which is a very big change, is PhD funding now comes with an expectation that all PhD students will spend time working within a non-academic but research-related environment at some point in their PhD. People did that previously, but it was more the exception. It wasn't expected. What's happened is we've flipped it. So now PhD students are expected to spend some time beyond academe as part of their PhD to get that broader range of insight and understanding. We've had public policy fellowships, a very important initiative. We're on phase two of these, so they're still quite new. What these policy fellowships provide are 18 months for an academic to be going based within a local authority, a regional government, a national government, a government department or a regulator, and they provide 18 months money to put them in a policy making environment with a partner organisation. What's also interesting about the policy fellowships and has provided quite a, an interesting topic of discussion is that people applying for those don't apply with a project. They apply for a policy fellowship on the basis of their experience and why they want to do one. But then the first phase of the fellowship, the first three months, the academic goes into the new policy team and is expected to just sit there, listen, learn what the team does, learn about the pressures of pressures of working in a policy environment, language, timescales, politics, big and small. And then they work in that first three months to co-produce and co-design a project with their team that will then be, provide the, the main 12 month focus of that fellowship. Those fellowships have provided, proved incredibly popular. Uh, we've just increased massively round two and um, we'll start recruiting round three in Christmas. But I think they give a flavor of the sort of direction of travel. Another thing we've just developed is this um, talent policy accelerator. Uh, this is gonna be a national level. This is for reverse travel. This will allow people based in the policy space broadly defined to apply to have secondments based and working within universities. So this is all about facilitating that mobility of people moving in and out of academe and policy space. And one of the most interesting announcements that came recently were changes for the REF 2028. Uh, I, I must apologize if I keep talking about REF, but it does really cast quite a large shadow over everything that happens in the UK, is that at the next REF, not all staff, academic staff, will have to return publications. Now, the rationale for this is to allow for greater mobility working within the policy space that universities would have loved to appoint into academia, but they didn't. And they didn't because those people obviously coming from beyond academia didn't have a publications profile and were therefore seen as too risky in REF terms. The fact now that not all return staff will have to have publications is designed to facilitate what's increasingly called blended or braided careers, where people can start off in academia, leave for a few years, come back in at a certain level, maybe progress and then go out and come back in, but to allow people to be able to have greater mobility within their academic career. As I said at the beginning, what's really interesting is that there's a whole new language developing. We talk about now porosity, permeability, absorption. I've just talked about braided careers, co-production, co-design, I careers, T careers. I mean, this is a whole new language that simply has evolved in the last two or three years but is all directly related to this greater shift or emphasis on not just on knowledge creation, but no knowledge mobilization, and a much greater emphasis on the nexus between research and policy. And the one I just highlighted there is something I think is really important, is a much greater emphasis now on what we call structured serendipity. Policy engagement work is in a sense very risky. I mean, policy makers are, not, are very rarely going to accept that there's an evidence base created in a university 
They're going to accept that evidence base, present it to politicians. Politicians agree with it. And on the basis of that research, the law changes, new regulations are changed or things like that. The policy engagement space is, by definition, very fuzzy. It can be very hard to articulate clear causal links. The, int the interesting thing about structured serendipity, though, which I think is really interesting, is that often working in that policy space will create opportunities that you can never expect would have happened when you first started to engage. So if I give you an example, you might start to submit evidence to a parliamentary committee. The evidence that you submitted may be completely ignored. It might be mentioned in the committee's final report, but the government decides to ignore it for whatever reasons. However, two, three years down the line, a civil servant that was involved in that policy space and did see your evidence might contact you. There might be a new plan. A window of opportunity is opened. They're looking for fresh ideas and suddenly opportunities that you never thought of can suddenly emerge. And that structured serendipity links back to um, um, a really important part of this space and understanding that it isn't often easy for, for staff, even if they invest a lot of time in policy engagement work, it's not often easy for them to get direct leverage and traction to achieve change because you're inevitably working in a small P and big P political context. But structured serendipity, making your own luck, starting to be active within policy making advisory systems can sometimes create new opportunities for data, linkage, information, research funding that you would never otherwise have come across unless you started to participate in that space. Now, this is really where I'm coming to an end. Because in a sense, the great issue where we are in the UK is that we've almost created a mirror image problem. The problem was essentially at first, the research ecosystem was very complex. And there was a concern that not enough research was finding its way into policy making processes, conversations and structures. So what's happened has been a very rapid shift to create a whole world of different boundary spanning institutions and centers. And at the moment, the whole structure is incredibly complex. And there are various attempts like this one to map the existing terrain, or like this one, to map the terrain between generating knowledge, translating knowledges, and adopting knowledge. And of course, what we're often interested in, in terms of the boundary spanning bodies like the What Work Centres, are those bodies in the centre there that are charged with curating or brokering that knowledge so it is accessible for policymakers. But in the UK, what's happened is this, almost the intermediary structures that have suddenly sprung up have become incredibly complicated. So why does this matter? Because what this has done is focus attention on the issue of research leadership. Because what we are requiring, requiring of academic researchers today is very different to what we were requiring of them just five or 10 years ago. Because now there is an expectation that researchers will range, and I use that term specifically, there's a very good book by David Epstein called Range, we're expecting our researchers to be able to range in a way that we simply didn't expect them to five or 10 years ago. And that is directly connected to this new emphasis on policy engagement work. Research leadership is all about how do we support researchers not to just do more research, but to mobilize and work with both individuals and teams of individuals to range across organizational, disciplinary, and professional boundaries in effective ways. But actually, what's really interesting, if you look at higher education, 
there's a lot of interest goes into leadership in relation to managerial leadership. If you want to be a head of department or a dean or a PVC, there's more emphasis nowadays on teaching and leadership. We have in a higher education academy that gives a whole range of different awards for leadership in relation to teaching. But research leadership isn't something that's ever received a lot of attention within academe. And what does research leadership mean? And what do institutions need to do to ensure that their staff have the requisite skills and attributes to play a role in this leadership space? Not as the single great, single heroic leader, but particularly with an emphasis on team science with different leadership roles within larger projects. One of the issues is that the current emphasis on team, on research leadership is often very much siloed in different disciplines and very much focused on the individual. So if you look at REF, REF is still based around disciplinary panels. If you look at promotion systems in the UK, they're still based very much on individuals and contributions to team science are often almost completely overlooked. So one of the questions about developing research leadership is making sure that staff who contribute to the careers of others, promote the we, not the, not the me, are themselves rewarded for that contribution to a broader range of sustaining activities in this space. So research leadership is an area where UKRI is investing a lot more money. It's interesting that we are moving towards a system where there are national research leadership programs, resources and training opportunities that cover the whole career system. So for early career researchers, mid-career, established scholars, and up to the most senior professors. So final thoughts. Let me just flick out a few other quick issues. One part of the activity in the UK is now that basically a policy unit to try to act as its own institutional boundary spanner, connecting the work of its staff into the broader policy space. Um, some of them, I would say, are more successful than others, but it's become almost something that all universities have felt they've had to establish in recent years. And I think there's a lot of learning to be done in terms of trying to understand which of those have been most effective in allowing and facilitating greater activity uh, of their staff. I'd point you towards these two reports that came out from the Institute for Government a couple of years ago, how government can work with academia, how academia can work with government. Two very, very good reports that are full of very good insightful tips and insights, often fairly low hanging fruit as well, which um, I know lots of institutions and lots of people have found incredibly helpful. Now, this is interesting. I've talked a lot about the UK today. I think the UK um, has been very active in this space, but there is a great opportunity here. Um, there is a huge opportunity for uh, an entrepreneurial and forward focused university. That this These issues that we're talking about the research policy interface is not a UK or an Irish issue, it's a global challenge. So now what we have are a number of new global networks that are working to bring people together in this space. SAPEA works particularly around the European Commission. Uh, research Impact Canada is very interesting, very, very dynamic, uh, does lots of interesting work. Uh, even though there isn't any uh, REF or IMPACT initiative in Canada, it's just built into the sort of higher education culture in a very vibrant manner. Uh, we have ARIS, the Advancing Research Impacts in Society in America, which is, again, all about fostering connection across uh, um, uh, uh, the United States. 
But also there's just been this new network created, the Africa Evidence Network, which is all about supporting uh, institutions in the global south and beyond to build capacity at the research policy interface. Now, at the moment, all these sort of global networks are, dare I say, flapping around developing expertise in their own spaces. But I think there is a real opportunity to bring some of these together and play a unifying role. And that brings me to uh, my final point. Where we've got to in the UK is that we actually need, I would say, a what works centre for what works when it comes to taking research into policy. Which is what exactly what this article in the Times Higher is all about. We almost need a new observatory to bring together and coordinate all the institutions and bridging bodies and investments that have been made in recent years that have often been thrown out there by different councils at different times with different ambitions, but have created a rather disconnected ecosystem. Hence my emphasis today on the need for strategic scaffolding. Now, why would I make this argument? If I go back to where I started in Ireland 2030, it's quite clear that there are similar ambitions in Ireland to nurture and um, innovate the intersection of research and policy. There's a huge amount that can be learned and insights taken from the UK. But the one thing I would underline is that the activity in Ireland needs a central coordinating hub based either nationally or based for a national purpose within a university to coordinate the outflow of activities, investments and training opportunities so that you don't end up with the rather confused, convoluted hyperactivity that we've had happen in the UK. So strategic scaffolding from the outset is my main insight from the UK that I would leave you with when discussing these issues in Ireland. So there you go. I'm going to take any questions that might have come up about any of that. Uh, thanks very much, Matt. I was just having a few Zoom problems there, so <laughs> apologies for that. But thank you very much for your very informative and engaging and, and very thought-provoking presentation. Um, I found it particularly interesting to see the thoroughness of the UK approach. And one question that, that struck me straight away was, um, has there been a huge increase in terms of activity between researchers and policy makers? And have you seen a big uptake on, on activity and, and research informed policy? Yes, I, I, I think it's been it's been massive. And it's even got to the point, I think, where some policymakers have started to feel a bit annoyed um, with being inundated by university academics who now want to engage with them. And often I think there's a sense that the university academics um, are trying to engage without maybe a subtlety of understanding about what policymakers do and their day to day job and a lack of funnels that can process requests to engage and work with policymakers. So in a sense, what we've had in the UK is we've had a very sudden, and this has been, again, I'm being very honest here, largely driven by REF and the need for all academics to think about impact case studies, that um, at the last REF, the whole of the UK civil service was told that they were not to provide letters of support for impact case studies because civil servants were just becoming overwhelmed in requests for letters. So I think that's I think overall it's been very, very positive. But I just think that in many ways it went from 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 nothing 
to a huge amount very quickly. And now what we're doing is almost working backwards to mature relationships and to promote mutual understanding. Please, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have a few questions too from the audience that I, I, I'll ask you now as well. And just starting from the top, um, we have a question about the role of learned societies in this ecosystem and, and what role do they play in terms of policy? Yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, I was um, head of the Political Studies Association for three years and um, the, the role of learned societies is interesting. Um, I think to be honest, uh, I'm going to be slightly um, provocative here. Um, I think the role I think learned societies themselves have been fairly slow in coming to the table with an understanding of the new contemporary future focused expectations that are now falling upon their members. So I, I, I think that actually learned societies have a massive role to play in this space in terms of supporting, training and developing academics within their discipline but I can't say it's easy for me to think of too many learned societies who I saw when I was on the research councils were playing a really full role in this space um, what's happened is more recently that the British Academy which is sort of the overall body for arts humanities social sciences um, they have started in recent years to play a more proactive role and they often they now have a whole new funding stream of innovation grants, which are work around explicitly working in policy. But I think there's an opportunity for learned societies to really. Um, step up to the plate. OK, great. Yeah. Um, another question, and this is a kind of a question about scale and does. Ireland's smaller scale as compared to the UK make that policy research divide easier to bridge or harder, in your opinion? Well, it's interesting. Um, <laughs> I was recently uh, working in Wales and talking about these topics. Mm. Somebody said, oh, well, the thing you don't understand, Matt, in Wales is that everybody knows each other because it's so much smaller. Um, I, I think what's interesting there, and there are very important equality, diversity and inclusion issues around the policy engagement agenda, which are really, really, really important. I think um, the fact of scale clearly matters. However, what I find often happens is that institutions tend to have a very small number of highly engaging academics that know how to do this and are therefore very visible, very rewarded, very active. One of the things that I've been really, uh, I was involved, not on my own, but I was involved with other people to create the uh, the new policy fellowships. The whole idea of the policy fellowships is that was designed to give people that had no existing knowledge or contacts to get that first step into making policy connections. So although scale issues in Ireland may well be different, I think there is still a need to think about EDI and how you support everybody who might want to engage to be able to engage if they want to, because I think it often doesn't happen. Can I just say one other thing? I don't, I, there's a real big political issue with policy engagement, and it's very important I raise it. I don't want everyone to think Matt Flinders is totally in, in favour of researchers doing policy engagement. I'm not. I think there are very important issues here about the co-option of academics into policymaking structures and the politicization of research to legitimate decisions that have been taken elsewhere for different reasons. So I, I'm, I'm, I think, and this goes back to learner societies, there is a really important issue here about researchers in universities knowing and having the confidence and ability to engage with policymakers, while at the same time having the skills to protect their criticality and their independence. My fear is as more money is attached to policy focused projects, 
what we're in danger of doing in the UK is creating a Faustian bargain where academics know for promotion or tenure, they need to bring in research money. So they'll go for the re research grants where there is big money attached, even if there is an implicit agreement that the academics are there to work within established procedures and not to rock the boat. So we don't want everybody doing policy engagement. We need to keep an ecosystem of critical scholars, detached scholars, skeptical scholars, but people engaged if they want to, as long as they understand the game they're playing. Great. Yeah. Um, another kind of related question, really, and it's again about the UK system. It's how it supports the engagement of researchers with non-profit organisations, particularly those that are at the cold face of societal need and often making and advocating for policy changes. Yes, I, I, to be quite honest, um, we haven't got there yet. That has okay. not been part of the debate. I'm not saying it shouldn't be. Um, the Most of the money and the What Works Centre has gone into boundary spanning, into central government or devolved government. However, and I, I, I honestly, I wouldn't know enough about this to comment. I would hope that some of the What Works Centres might work with a range of stakeholders to facilitate conversations and maybe in that way help to support some of those that are maybe uh, have less resources. But also, I think that goes back to the issues about criticality and co-production. One of the ways that UK based researchers at the moment can get research funding is by working with potential research tutors that can often be charities. Those charities are often highly dependent on the money that can come in through research funding indirectly. So you can end up with some very, very weird relationships where the research user is dependent on the academic for really important sustaining money in a way that research funding was never supposed to be used for. But again, I think that's a really helpful question that, that just starts to unravel some of the deeper complexities that, 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 that haven't really been um, unraveled in the UK. Okay. Um, our next question looks at training. So what does good policy engagement training for researchers look like? And then on the other side of that, what about research engagement training for policymakers themselves? And how okay, can this so, be supported? <laughs> okay, so gosh, that is a very big question. And and after today, I'm going to send around these these two very there's two really fantastic uh, articles. One is about what every policymaker needs to know about science. And then the other one is what every scientist knows needs to know about policymaking. And, and they're really, really interesting. I think actually um, what is most important is not chalk and talk training. What, in my experience, researchers dread is if they think there's going to be more professional development courses come online that they're going to have to go to to tick a box, boom, boom, boom. That is not what, what is needed. What is actually most valuable are what has become known as the crucible effect. And the crucible effect is simply opportunities for people from different backgrounds, from different disciplines and different professional backgrounds related to policy broadly defined to be able to come together to work around a shared challenge, but in doing so to understand the different insights, pressures, language, wants, desires of each respective domain. And I find that once you actually, and again, I'm very interested in what are called steps, short-term experiential placements. So at the moment we have the policy fellowships, they're 18 months. That's fantastic. And it's, you know, the, 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 uh, Researchers that have been on them have, have raved about them, particularly because actually what they've, and this is an important thing, when those researchers went on those policy fellowships, they would often contact me and they would say, oh, Matt, I'm really worried. I'm on this fellowship, but I don't think I'm going to be able to produce three academic articles on it this year. And I would say to them, the aim of these policy fellowships was not for you to produce more publications. It was for you to build your networks of knowing people, understanding how the policymaking system works, and to develop your skills 
and expertise. And you take all of that back to your institution. And then actually, not only will that help you in your career going forward, but hopefully you can share some of those contacts and insights with other colleagues. Now, of course, the problem there is that, that some of those people are worried that when they go back to their institution, their head of department is going to say, oh, you're a bit low on publications for this year and won't give credit for the fact that they've done this incredibly fellowship in policy. Well, that's an issue for the institution and for senior uh, leadership teams. But what is really valuable is not necessarily these big fellowships, because obviously there are EDI implications, and we've done a lot of work to build that in, but short-term experiential placements. If you've got a member of staff, even if they just spend half a day a month shadowing somebody in a policy-making environment, you'll be amazed how much they get from that half a day a month in terms of understanding, access, skills, breadth of visibility, range. I mean, actually, it's quite shocking. I mean, it, it really is. So it, it doesn't have to be massive. And the notion of braided or blended careers doesn't have to mean people leaving completely. But it is about how do we facilitate mobility and maybe small steps. And of course, that works the other way. How do you allow people to step back into your research community from beyond academe? Yeah, I mean, very, very comprehensive answer there. And I think you've given us, again, a lot to think about. And uh, we'd be really looking forward to for you sharing those, um, the advice that you have on the, uh, you know, training for researchers and policymakers. And, and a somewhat related question then, do you think that the UK is the most advanced system then, or is there another um, benchmark globally that might eclipse it? Yeah, I think I think um, I think the UK probably is the most advanced um, system in terms of the overall ecosystem and um, uh, activity at the nexus between research and policy. Yes. Um, would I say it's the best? No. Where would I send people to study systems where I think it works in a far more. Uh, manner i would send you to research impact can because i think there they really do have a culture that supports okay. policy engagement in a way that is is bottom up and very um collegial it's not a top-down bureaucratic research impact case study demand led environment um what's also interesting of course and this is why i say about the international is unfortunately the uk globally is often seen as an innovator and leader in public sector management reform so right now, as we speak, the Japanese government has just introduced research impact case studies to its national assessment system. So in Japan, you have a whole sudden massive interest and rapid building of boundary spanning structures as 500 universities, many of which are global leaders, suddenly try to get a handle on what does knowledge mobilization look like particularly when you have to evidence it in a very tangible manner so i think there are um i think this is a very live topic uh globally and as i say i think the uk is seen as a global leader but i think what's happened in the uk has been a lot of activity and i must say i'm you know i was part of it a lot and a lot of people say it's not a problem it's you know let a thousand flowers bloom or whatever the phrase is but I do think that the the architecture of the UK has just now become bewilderingly complex and overlapping, I and mean, there's a need for some sort of clarification. Right. Yeah. Um, the, the next question um, kind of harks back to your comment earlier on about you know uh, somebody somebody does a fellowship and you know that they're not cranking out the same volume of publication outputs per year, oh. but mm. Then how should universities recognize and reward policy engagement when it can take years for it to translate into impact, uh, yeah, if it I, does I, at all? Yeah, if, if it happens at all. And I mean, I, I think um, what is interesting here, and, and again, this is very live where we're at, I think there is a big issue around senior leadership teams. And there are examples of, 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 of big reports on this and universities that have been very 
very at the cutting edge of this, about, about it is possible to deliver, define and measure a broader definition of contribution to research within an institution, which recognises that, I mean, OK, let me stop. I didn't answer that very well. Let me introduce you to the difference between what's called the I career and the T career. Do you know about this? Personally, no. So okay. um, I'm all ears. OK, so so basically the notion of the I career is that when you start off your career, particularly in academia, you're very much focused on me, the I, the individual, because you have to develop and build your own research reputation as a self-standing scholar. 100%. Now, the notion of the T career is simply that as you progress in your career and go up through um, the, the sort of middle ranks to becoming a full professor, by that point, you should have moved towards a T career, where a lot of your role, activity and energy is not about you, but it is about contributing and building the team and the next generation of you from below. Yeah. So it's quite... It's quite doable and the policy engagement work would be all part of this to building a wider range of, of ways to recognize the T career. And if somebody's career is 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 no longer as fantastic in terms of research in how they've basically been investing their time in supporting everybody else around them in the way that actually should we should all be doing at a certain point. In, in, in universities. So a broader definition of research excellence and research contribution that looks beyond the very narrow academic currency of peer reviewed publications and research income. Because if you do that, then all you're doing is you're trapping people into an I career. It does call, this is all about leadership in universities to be quite honest. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think our final question too probably probably brings this a step further again, and it looks at, you know, given given that there there are potential high rewards for individuals and institutions for applied research, where is the space in the ecosystem in the ecosystem for curiosity driven research for the sake of knowledge, or where policy impacts may not be seen for a very long time? Does that happen? Yeah, I think that is um, anybody interested in, the, in in that topic, I think would um, Sir Paul Nurse was very, very open about this potential tension um, in the first view to the creation of UKRI. I personally don't agree so much with this distinction between blue sky thinking and applied research. I think a lot of blue sky thinking, because of structured serendipity, it will unexpectedly lead to findings on, and results that can have some real world tangible benefit, although maybe be it not in the immediate short term. And I think lots of applied research can often have significant implications back to theory and fundamental thinking. The, the big issue, though, is that for any healthy research ecosystem, it needs to be able to sustain and nurture both. And my slight worry is at a UK level is that too much is going more towards the applied short term issues and working with research users and that space for just potentially transformative, but high risk, um, uh, high risk, high reward research has been sort of closed down. But I suppose on that, um, we do have this new organisation in the UK, which is. Uh, just been created called the Advanced Invention and Research Agency, um, £800 million. This was Dominic Cummings' great project. It, 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 many people thought it wouldn't come into fruition, but it has. Now, what's interesting there, area, and you'll find this online, the Advanced Research and Invention Agency, um, this has been established explicitly on the basis that universities are too conservative. Wow. in how they do research, that funding bodies are too conservative in how they do research and how they commission research, the peer review system. Actually, we all know it's very hard to get really ambitious research or publications through peer review. So we have this new agency, which has literally just been established in Manchester, that is being created to create 
that focus on blue sky pure research. Um, and maybe maybe about uh, in Ireland with the issue of scale is I just wonder if it if it might allow you to have some more direct and honest conversations with ministers and senior policymakers about these basic issues of how do we nurture a balanced research development and innovation ecosystem that helps to facilitate activity at the research nexus interface whilst at the same time recognizes the value of blue sky work and also recognizes the need to defend criticality and how do we make that happen the key thing is i think that it would be of great value for there to be some national center for excellence to from the outset connect catalyze and collaborate because by having that central national center of excellence you should be able to maximize the efficiency and av avoid the complexity and overlap that we've created in the uk more broadly yeah i think that's a really good point to 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 leave it on and uh, i think we've come to the end of our questions so um, I'd, I'd like to say, well, thank you very much again for taking the time to speak to us today. And I think your insights and pers perspectives are really valuable. And, I, and judging from the questions that we've had, I can see that the audience was thoroughly engaged by your presentation. So it was a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, I'd also like to extend my gratitude to my colleague, David Bennett, for organizing uh, this seminar. And most importantly, I'd like to express my thanks to all the audience for attending and their active participation. Um, we're very grateful for, for everyone to take the time out from their busy schedules to, to make this seminar today. So we hope to have the pleasure of your company again uh, at some time uh, at one of our future seminars. So until then, um, we'll call it a day and we'll say goodbye for now. Okay, so thank, thank you very you. much, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye.